Uh, good morning and welcome to Sunday Worship here at Emmanuel. We're glad to have you worshiping with us today, whether you're here in person or you're watching on our live stream. Our call to worship today comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. Uh, beloved, it is all too easy for us to think about our salvation in individual terms. And while that's not wrong, if that's all we do, we'll actually have an incomplete picture of what God's design is for us in salvation. Uh, scripture often uses imagery like the vine and the branches, the cornerstone and the building, a body and its parts, and so on, in part to communicate the corporate nature of our Christian identity and our salvation. And God's design for us in salvation has always included a corporate dimension with Christ being the center of it all. And the church is the visible expression to the world of this corporate body with Jesus being the head and the groom of the church. Ultimately, beloved, we are saved into Christ to be his church, the very means by which God has chosen to reveal his glory through us who are a broken people to a broken world. So as we begin our worship this morning, uh, let us remember that because we are his church, God is working to purify us in order to present us to himself as a perfect bride. So beloved, hear the word of the Lord from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer slaves and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are, all, you are, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Amen. Uh, let us come before God, thankful that he has joined us together with himself through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us pray. morning church can we all rise for a time of worship Shout to God, all 
Jesus has such a high view of his church, of which we are a part, how can we choose not to love the church as he does? And if Jesus has chosen to purify his church, how can we choose to live apart from it? Uh, when we're honest, we often choose to compartmentalize the church as something that is supplemental to our lives. But in a very real sense, there is no Christian life 
without the church. So when we're not committed to Jesus' church, whatever our reasons may be, be it its flaws or our past hurts from the church, we are saying to Jesus that the church is not worth it. Uh, therefore, this morning, Jesus is calling us to confess to whatever degree we have trouble or we struggle in loving his church and to return to giving ourselves over to him completely and to his church as well. So Emmanuel, join with me reading the call to confession from 1 John chapter 4, verses 19 through 21. Let us begin. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this is the commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Amen. Emmanuel, let us come before God, confessing that we act like the body he died for is not worth our time. Let us pray. Beloved, hear God's promise of mercy and grace from 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. With this assurance of God's grace towards us, let us confess our faith by reciting the Apostles' Creed in one voice. Let us begin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Emmanuel will now respond with a song of thanksgiving.
Let's pray together. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Uh, Jesus, we thank you that we can come approach you just as we are. Uh, some of us feel like we're not good enough to be saved or maybe feel obligated to live in a certain way in order to be saved. But God, allow us to truly know that we are saved by grace, through faith, not by works, so that no one can boast. God, we pray for miracles. We want to see your unmistakable hand in miracles so that we can testify of your works and your goodness. We want to see transformation of the most stubborn hearts. We want to see people beating addictions. We want to see people overcoming illness. We want to see reconciliation and broken relationships. We want to see all of this so that you would receive all the glory. Lord, we pray that by being rooted in scripture and with guidance from the Holy Spirit, we could grow in maturity and bear fruit. God, protect your people from wavering hearts. Father, let our faith be rooted in an unchanging, faithful God. Help us not be swayed by when our brothers and sisters sin, but please give us the heart to prayerfully walk with them through struggle, to encourage them, to sharpen them, to love them. God, help us identify and throw aside everything that weighs us down in the race that we are running. Give us the power to overcome the sin that entangles us. We pray that you would use our talents and treasures to build your kingdom and your church. God, we pray that Emmanuel Church would be moved to serve and to put our faith to action. We pray that you would lift up teachers for our education department, ones who are passionate about teaching the gospel and walking with children as they learn to navigate this broken world. Uh, we pray for lead worshipers on the praise team who point all the glory to you. We pray for the welcoming team who demonstrate love and compassion as Christ has done for us. We pray for media team to share your truth and good works through media. We pray for sound AV team to worship God through their technical and artistic gifts. We pray for outreach team to share the gospel beyond our church. We pray for life groups, women's, men's, young, young adult, college groups, that they would be able to disciple your people in all life stages and walks of life. Uh, we pray for intercessory prayer team to establish a culture where we make prayer rather than our own feelings or wisdom our first response to everything. Uh, Jesus, we pray that Emmanuel Church would not just make you a, a, a priority, but make you the foundation of our entire lives, and that together, in unity, encouraging one another, we can live the life to which we are called. All glory to you. We pray all this in your son Christ's name. Amen. Uh, hello and welcome again to Emmanuel Sunday Worship. My name is Amandi and I serve as one of the pastors here. Uh, if you're a newcomer, if you've been with us for some time but haven't joined, um, who haven't come to welcome you yet, uh, please join us after service out there in the lobby. There's a newcomer's booth. Uh, we'd just like to get to know you, answer any questions you may have, um, and get to you plugged into our church if that's something you're interested in doing. Uh, we're continuing to renovate the apartment uh, that our church is sponsoring in partnership with City Team. Uh, this apartment complex serves victims of domestic violence, and so if you're interested in how get to know how to get involved. Um, information can be found on our website or you can reach out to any of the names that you see on the screen. Um, our next round of life groups will be starting shortly. And so if you would like to participate in one, uh, whether you're in one now or have never been in one uh, in EPC, we do ask for you to please sign up by the end of today. So the deadline to sign up is today. Um, so please follow the QR code and sign up and then we'll get the groups uh, started as soon as possible. Uh, we do have a ministry fair that is taking place today, right after service, um, so please uh, don't go home yet. If you have to go get your kids, please do so and then come back. Uh, so all the different ministry teams will be presenting what they're about and how they need help. And so, and, and the way for us to love the church is for us to participate in its activities, um, not just here, but also locally. Um, so please join us as you come in here, what we're doing as a church, what we plan to be doing next year. Um, and see how you can participate and join us as we walk together in loving God and his church. 
Uh, we will also have a leaders retreat on October 4th and 5th um, here at church for those currently serving as leaders and those who will be stepping up to be leaders in the next year. So please come learn how and why we serve. Uh, come and learn the church's vision as to how we want to be walking together and be a light, not just to ourselves, but to San Jose and to the rest of the world. Um, Youth Connect is a program which is aiming to train families on how to intentionally connect with God and with one another. Uh, it's especially targeted at parents with uh, children in 7th through 12th grade. So if you have children in that age range or in that class range, uh, please make a note of this and RSVP. It's going to be uh, $30 per parent and youth uh, child care uh, pair, so please do so. Um, also, the Korean Culture Day will be taking place on October 5th. This is being hosted by the Emmanuel Korean School. So if you don't know, there is a Korean school that meets on Saturday uh, to teach people how to speak Korean. Perhaps one day I might be a part of that. Anyway, uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, this is a time for you know, children ages 5 to 17 to connect to the Korean culture. Um, and so if you have kids in that age group or you have their friends, this is a good opportunity to invite their friends who may not know Christ yet to come to church and to see what we're all about in a fun and very inviting way. Uh, the men's ministry will be starting another eight-week um, book club uh, starting on October 12th. It'll be taking place from 8.30 a.m., I think, to like 10.30 a.m. Uh, if you have any questions about this book club, please reach out to Brother Enoch or Deacon James uh, about this uh, book club. I think we'll be reading The Divine Conspiracy. Yeah, it says The Divine Conspiracy is what we'll be reading. So you can check that book out on Amazon, and if you're interested, you can pick up the book on your Kindle. Um, for the more announcements, please check out our announcement section of our website for other news and updates about things going on in our church. And to prepare to receive God's word, could we please rise and greet one another with the love of Christ. We all rise and stand for the reading of God's word. Today's word comes from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 to 25. Please give your careful attention. This is the reading of God's word. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Amen. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you. God, we pray as we hear the word today. God, may it bring strength. Lord, may it bring strength and hope. Lord, we pray. Father, meet us here. Bring us strength, Lord. Give us hope. Give us healing. Lord, as we talk about the church, the church is quite a complicated topic, Lord. Um, Lord, there are hurts and pains and disappointments and failures. Lord, we look at even the churches of our past. Um, for those of us who grew up in the Korean American immigrant church, Lord, we see the difficulties and the pains that it has caused, uh, some, some of these things personal. But Lord, we pray, Lord, may we hold fast to the confession of Christ, and may that bring hope, healing, and Lord, a new future, and seeing, Lord, that the day is drawing near, and so that, Lord, we would uh, gather together as Christians, waiting and it's anticipating for the day for you to come. And so, Lord, may we be faithful today in encouraging, uplifting one another in love. 
in faith and hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we say good morning to the person next to us? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And if there's a, if you know that there's a husband next to you, just like give him a, like a pound, like, hey, husband. It might not be your husband, but uh, <laughs> just, hey, what's going on? <laughs> the reason why I say this is because I want to start off with a question uh, for those who are husbands. Imagine someone comes to you and says, hey, we want to invite you over for dinner. We you think you're such an amazing person, you're such an amazing guy, and we want to have you over for dinner. And so normally as a husband, the, what, what, what's the thing that you would say first thing? Let me talk to my wife. <laughs> I hope so, <laughs> or she's going to talk to you. But let me talk to my wife, because that's, that's, you know, our wife is so important. But what if, <laughs> what if they say, well, we don't want to invite your wife. Uh, and you ask Why? And they say, oh, to be honest, we don't really like her. Well, th thank you for these reactions. It's great. <laughs> we find her a bit difficult. And we'd rather spend time with you. She's, a, she's actually disappointing. She has a lot of baggage. And every time she, we talk to her, just the mood goes down. Now, as husbands, what would you do? How do you react? For the husbands in the room, tell the person next to you, what would you do? Actually tell them, what would you do? <laughs> I'll defend you. <laughs> yeah, it would be an, uh, absolutely offensive. Uh, it would be very, very difficult to hear, and I hope none of us ever have that kind of interaction or conversation ever. Yet there's someone who hears this more often than we'd expect, and it comes across something like this. I love Jesus, but I don't like the church. I don't attend a church. I, I'm, I, am, I consider myself Christian, and I, I'm a sinner saved by grace, but I'm not so much into church. I don't really need it. All I need is Jesus and me, and not really the church. Consider how Jesus might feel about hearing about his bride, the church. Um, in Scripture, the Scripture, the church is often referred to as the bride of Christ. And when we distance ourselves from the church, it's similar to telling Jesus we want a relationship with him, but not the very person that he died for, his beloved. And so for some, these, stems, these feelings stem from past hurts or disappointments within the church community. Others might feel fatigued or believe that they can nurture their faith independently, and especially in our day, day, day and age today with the convenience of online sermons with wonderful pastors and preachers and resources online. Why even come out to church? Why, is it, why make the effort? Well, today... That's what we want to talk about. Today, the early church also faced very, a, a very similar challenge with some neglecting to meet together regularly. And the author of the Hebrews emphasizes why belonging to the church is not just important, it's essential for believers. And there are three reasons why, according to today's passage. And so, if you can say to the, next, to the person next to you, belonging to the church is essential. <clears throat> Yes, it's essential. Let me share it to us why. Verse 23, it's to anchor us, holding fast to our confession of hope. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. You know, the early Christians to whom the letter was written to, they were experiencing incredible persecution, very, very intense persecution. They faced social ostracism, loss of property, imprisonment, and even death of their loved ones and even themselves because of their faith in Jesus Christ. So the pressure to abandon the faith and to return to their old ways was very tempting and immense. And as a result, some believers chose to isolate themselves, neglecting to meet together with other fellow Christians. And so think of a flag, a flag that's on a pole and it's just as the wind is blowing hard and the gusts are blowing, it's just one just thread away from flying away. And it's, it's faith stretched in and grip weakening. And perhaps there's those of us who are in this room who can relate to this feeling. Maybe you know somebody, family member or a friend, who's just on the verge. They're just kind of get. they're really about to give up on church. Who's on the brink of leaving the faith or just, just, just leaving here, even our church. And perhaps you, have, you, are, you yourself have the urge to step back due to dis discouragement, doubt, or external pressures, jaded, jadedness. The weight of personal struggles or past hurts can make us feel like that flag in the storm, just ready to be let go. 
And here's the remarkable thing of God, what God's word does. And this is what the author of Hebrew does because this is, this is exactly what's happening to the people that he's writing to. And instead of being a teacher, instead of being a, a theologian and scholar, he becomes a pastor to them. And he doesn't, come, he doesn't say, how dare you, you weak Christians? You better get your act, act right. You, don't you believe in God? How dare you? Or he also doesn't say, here are 10 reasons why you should stay in church. I'm here to give you five practical reasons for you to stay in church. Here's what he does. Look at how he responds. Instead of judging or providing practical solutions, he does the most wonderful thing. He redirects their focus to the person of Jesus Christ. It's the most powerful thing. He understands that what they need most is a renewed vision of who Jesus Christ is. Who is Jesus and what he has accomplished? And so starting from verse 19, that we begin to see, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, because of Jesus who has cleansed us completely, he enables us to approach the almighty God with sincere hearts. Verse 20, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, Jesus tore the veil, removing completely the separation between humanity and God himself. Verse 21, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, that Jesus, the great high priest, is interceding for us on our behalf right now as we speak, speaking to God the Father of why we should be forgiven and why we are considered his children. And verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, that Jesus ultimately is the faithful one, that he is here to wash us completely clean, and he will be faithful to the very end as he has demonstrated in scripture and even in our lives. Why do we hold, why do we struggle to hold fast to this confession? What is it about us? And there are typically two reasons why we don't hold fast to the confession, to the gospel. Number one, here's one of the reasons, It's because Jesus really isn't that great. Or second, Jesus is that great, but we just don't realize it. And I believe it's the latter. The challenge for us as Christians, as sinners, is that God is that great, and we don't know it. We forget it. We don't don't understand, and we need to get to know this. He deserves all of our hearts. Often our greatest struggles with Jesus is that we don't have a high high of enough view of him. We settle for a limited understanding when there's so much more to discover about who God is, the beauties of Christ, and the power of his work. God is far greater than we realize, and he invites us to anchor ourselves in who he is. Our primary need isn't more effort. Our primary need is a greater conviction and understanding of who Jesus is. Life group leaders, for those who are are here, the greatest thing that you can do as you lead your life group isn't how to better dissect the sermon, how to better explain the sermon, but rather for you to share your conviction of who Jesus is. That is the greatest thing you can do for your life group. For our elders and deacons, the greatest thing that we can do as officers is to lead the church that they would see who Jesus is more and more. Not about strategies of the church, now how we can grow this church, but how our church can go from looking downward to looking upward and seeing who God is. If you have brothers and sisters who are struggling, friends who are struggling, the best thing you can do is point them gently to the love of God and the faithfulness of him. To pray for them. To put a hand on them. More so than sharing solutions, more so than sharing sympathy, it's by sharing who the person of Jesus is. That is the greatest thing that we could do. Because oftentimes we are very blinded. There's darkness that covers our eyes, that, help, that prevents us from seeing the glory of who Jesus truly is. That's exactly what Satan does. He starts to really mask our vision so that we wouldn't see Jesus and that we would be focused on the other things. But the more we grasp, the more we hold fast to, the more we're anchored to the gospel of Jesus Christ, it brings healing, it brings hope, it brings a better understanding. Think of Peter. When Peter is walking on the water, I mean, this is incredible what he's doing. And as his eyes are fixed on Jesus, he's able to do that which humans can never do, walk on water. 
But the moment he begins to look at the waves, that's when he begins to drown and sink. In the same way, when we focus on Christ, we can stand firm, even in the midst of life's storms. But when we focus on our own inadequacies or the obstacles around us, we begin to falter. And so one, one of the th- what, what the author of Hebrews is doing and the call for us as the church is to not so much view our inadequacies, but to look at the sufficiency of Christ, to see his power and his finished work on the cross, and that we are empowered then to persevere. This Christ-centered focus transforms our hearts, fuels our faith, and anchors our souls amidst life's storms. And this precisely is why belonging to the church is, es- is essential. The church is a gathering centered on the worship of Jesus. If it's, if it's not that, then it's not worth our time. In, in other words, every Sunday we are here gathered to have a clear vision of who he is, the one who loved us and gave himself for us. That is my prayer. Every time we come to worship, Lord, in whatever way you want to use me, I want people leaving here with a better understanding and not just a clear understanding, but a real understanding of who Jesus is. That's my simple prayer. And if I, if I don't do that, if I make it about uh, techniques of how to be a better Christian or how to have better finances, I believe I failed as a pastor. I failed that week. What I want to do is that our gaze would shift, not so much about me, but so much more about him. And to see who God is, because that's where the power of God then begins to dwell within the people of God. The church is where we collectively remember and celebrate God's faithfulness, gathering together, strengthening our grip on this anchor who is Christ and is powerful when we do this together as a church and we sing songs, and we listen, and we praise God together as a church and confess that Jesus Christ is king. Because just as much as Jesus is real, the enemy is real too. Satan is a historian. He's a great historian. And I'm I'm sure many of us have experienced this. The whisper that he whispers right into our ear, and he brings up the past, doesn't he? Hey, remember when you did this? Remember this when you when you broke God's law, remember when you did all these things and we begin to feel the shame and the guilt coming back again. And those moments, he's wanting, even though he cannot take away our salvation, what he's trying to do is make us doubt our salvation. But just as much as Satan is a historian, we can use history back at him too. While you, I remember, yes, I remember the times I've broken God's law. I remember those times, but I also remember Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Jesus Christ died for my sins. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. He's a real historical person who has saved me from the grips of death, from the wrath of God, and now I have full life in him. That anchoring. So that Satan doesn't divide his, God's people, Satan doesn't attack God's people, and that we fall away, but rather we are anchored. And so even if we are a flag about to fly away, we anchor onto Christ. and We, 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 we just cling on to him. My wife sent me a text this morning. I love what she wrote. Uh, she sent me this uh, post, and it says this. If you feel like you're hanging on by a thread, make sure it's the hem of his garment. Make sure you anchor onto Christ. If there's anything that you need to anchor onto, anchor onto the promise of Christ and to the gospel. See the beauty of what he has done and his work. Pray so that we would hold fast to the confession of our hope, not because of our strength, but because he who promised is faithful. Amen. Second, as we anchor ourselves of the past, there's a present work that happens for us as Christians. And this is where we get assurance, encouragement through Christian fellowship. Verse 24, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works. The author of Hebrews shifts his focus to the present now, highlighting the vital role of Christian fellowship in helping believers persevere in their faith. He emphasizes that confidence and assurance cannot ever thrive in isolation. We need the support and encouragement of the church community to remain steadfast. Uh, Just as a, a single coal, when it's taken out from the pile of coal, that coal dies out very quickly, very fast. But when it's in the midst of the coal, it continues to burn brighter and burn longer 
Fellowship with other Christians provides the warmth and encouragement we need to stay spiritually vibrant that I need. It says here, if you read this passage, we are called to stir up one another to love and good works. And this is a very, this is a very uh, important thing that he's uh, laying out here, the author. If you read this, it's very simple. He doesn't say be stirred up. It's not a passive thing. He's not saying come to church and be motivated, be stirred up by the preaching, be stirred up by the food, by the fellowship. But rather he shifts the burden onto the people of God themselves, not just the pastors, but whoever considers themselves a people of God. You are the subject. And what are we called to do? We are all called to stir up one another to love and good works. Because church, and this is the principle that I believe Hebrews lays out, the church is not about satisfaction. It's about sanctification. It's about, this is exactly what God is calling us to do. What is God's greatest desire of us? It says in Romans 8, 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many, many brothers, to be conformed into the image of Christ, to be like Christ. That is God's greatest desire of us. As he saves us, now he wants us to be more like him. And if one is not part of the church or a church, I don't see how sanctification will be touching someone's life. This love, stirring up of one another, is a communal activity, not an individual one. And marriage is a great example of this. Uh, I talk about marriage a lot, if you notice, because marriage has been one of the most greatest teachers for me as I've learned so much of the beauties of the gospel through marriage. And I met somebody who was in his 60s, and he was married for 30 years. And he was sharing how in all his 30 years of marriage, he made his wife cry three times ever. And I was shocked because I made my wife cry three times last week. <laughs> I, I shared this to Elder Tom and he couldn't believe it. He said, <laughs> he was like, he only, she only cried three times in front of him. She probably cried a lot right behind his back. But anyway, <laughs> See, one of the things that I've learned about marriage is that marriage does not cause problems. Marriage reveals problems. It revealed my issues. Because what marriage did is that it revealed my self-centeredness more than anything else. And it's not that marriage caused me to be more selfish, but rather it was that selfishness I brought into marriage, that baggage I brought into marriage, and marriage was the, only, was the thing that revealed that to me. Same it is with community. The more you begin to live in community, community begins to reveal in fact, my sins, our sins, it begins to reveal who I really am. The church is messy. It is. It's very messy. And the more, but the more we see and hold fast to Jesus and what he has done, as a result, the church becomes more beautiful. Because sanctification is the way for us to be assured God truly loves me because I'm now being more like Jesus. Assurance of faith assurance of salvation, that I'm actually growing fruit as I'm in the midst of my sin, as I see my sin, I see my spirit repenting. What a way to be assured of my faith, to know, yes, the gospel is real in my life. Now, it's important to acknowledge that the church is made up of imperfect people. There will be conflicts, misunderstandings, and a lot of disappointments. And so for some of us, the idea of belonging to a church may feel very painful or even burdensome. Perhaps you've been hurt by the very community meant to embody the love and grace of Christ. Maybe you've experienced judgment, rejection, or betrayal as a result of being part of the church. Or even hearing the call to be part of the church and it feels very overwhelming. And at first I want to acknowledge that your pain is very real. There are very, very much stories that break my heart. It real, it's real and it matters. You know, the church is meant to be a place where people can find healing and refuge, but sometimes, in fact, it's a place of hurt and disappointment. And uh, I think the people, I don't want to alienate, but for those of us who grew up in the Korean American church, because we are part of Korean church too, there's also that as well. Uh, jadedness towards Korean American church, jadedness towards the immigrant church. But the author of Hebrews speaks about the importance of fellowship and stirring up one another, knowing that this is an imperfect community. He's speaking to a perfect community, to a perf into an imperfect people group. 
Because he's calling us to persevere together despite our imperfections. That's why he's shifting the, the command to all of us to stir up one another in love and to goodness. God's desire is that, is that we reflect his love and grace not only in the good times, but also through the challenges and brokenness. Because this transformation of sanctification often happens through the difficult moments. But we must choose love over bitterness, patience over frustration, forgiveness over resentment, and how Christ died on the cross. This is where grace is more realized because it's not about holy perfection, but about holy direction. The church is not a collection of perfect people, but a family of believers striving to grow in Christ-likeness. That even in this messiness and even in this very imperfect environment, that God often does his most transformative work. If every church experienced, if every church experience were flawless, where would we learn the the depth of grace? If no one ever wronged us or failed us, how would we understand forgiveness? It is precisely because we are in a community of imperfect people that we can experience and extend the grace that Jesus so freely gives. Charles Spurgeon says this, I love this quote, Maybe some of us have heard this before. If I had never joined a church till I have found one that was perfect, I should never have joined one at all. And the moment I did join it, if I had found one, I should have spoiled it. Take a moment to think about what he's saying there. It's very humbling what he's saying. Charles Spurgeon admits that every one of us contributes not to the perfection of the church. In fact, we all contribute to the imperfection of the church. Oof. Oof. That's, that's, a, that's a rebuke, but a soft rebuke. Because at the end of the day, I am far from perfect, and I bring my baggage into this church. Even as a pastor, I'm speaking right now, I bring my baggage, my sin, into this church. But instead of focusing on the church's flaws, we need our call to fix our eyes on Christ anchoring ourselves, who is the head of the church, because he is the ultimate example, the power of how to love, serve, and forgive. He is the example of even though those who have wronged him, he stayed, he committed. The church needs people like you, people who have experienced pain in church, and yet they choose to stay and be a part of God's work of healing and transformation. Your story, your compassion, and your understanding can be a testimony and witness of God's grace. In 1966 in Wales, there was a disaster called the Aberfan Disaster. It was a local town, uh, and much, much of that town's economy was on black coal, coal. Unfortunately, there was a huge avalanche that happened And in the path of the coal avalanche, if you ever look at the photos, it's incredible. It's black, just slurry of rocks coming down the mountain. And in the path of the coal avalanche was an elementary school. 116 young children died that day. In the aftermath of this disaster, what the town did, they all gathered and they worshiped. And they sang. And here's the hymn that they sung. Loving shepherd of thy sheep, keep thy lamb is safety keep. Nothing can thy power withstand. None can pluck me from thy hand. It's powerful. As they faced death, as parents saw their children taken away, friends gone they went to the only person they knew who was above all those things they went to the Lord and they sang and they lamented to him because the promise of the gospel was the only thing that gave them hope I admit you know there are times where I come inside Sunday service and I'm so weary I don't feel it like I, I I'm, I'm I had a hard week, I'm discouraged, I don't know. Something about today, I'm just not worshipful. But when I see brothers and sisters, when I know your stories, I know, the pr- I know what you're going through. It breaks my heart. And yet, when I see hands lifted high, 
singing glory, glory to God. That's, that is strengthening to the church. That's how we stir up and lift one another up. That even as we experience hurt and pain, that we choose to believe and trust in the Lord. And we choose to stay. That is the power of the church. And how we can truly lift one another up. And as it's saying, saying here, stirring up one another to love. To, because the claim, I can do this alone, it is to contradict Christ's purpose for his followers. The church is not merely a building or an event. It is the body of Christ meant to f- function and build up one another together. Some may think you can get, get better teaching online, and I 100% agree. You can hear better sermons online. But there's something that cannot be replaced, the gathering of the church here together. And I'm not saying you have to be part of our church, because then that's a cult. <laughs> you have to be part of our church and no other church. No, that's, that's a bad sign. If you're a part of that, those kinds of church, yeah, kind of, uh, it's a little shady. But we hope, if it's not our church, that we pray that you would find another church. You know, I, I was talking to a sister yesterday, and, and it's so funny because this is something that I didn't really share yet because I've been praying about it, and she shared it. But one of the things that we want to do, I want to do as a church, is that we want to pray for other churches in this area, lifting them up in prayer, the pastors. I, I, I still don't know them yet because I'm still transitioning and I want to get to know the pastors here. But I believe the best thing that we can do is to pray for other churches, pray for their members, Pray that they stay. Pray that they would find grace in their church and in God's grace so that they would, because we, we, need, we need each other. In order for the gospel to win the Bay Area, it doesn't just need Emmanuel Presbyterian Church. It needs all churches to partner together. It's one of the things I would love to do, especially in our time of worship, is to lift up churches by name, pastors by name, lifting them up so that they too would experience the grace of God and strength and that we would come together as one. And so the author of Hebrews urges us not to make excuses, but to prioritize fellowship and mutual encouragement. And so if you've been hurt, it's okay to take time to heal. God sees your wounds and knows your heart. His love for you is not diminished by your struggles with the church. But here's what I would love to say. Don't let your hurt be the final word to your faith and to the church. Let Christ's word be the final word. Let Christ's word be healing to you. Because there's a place for you in the family of God, a place for you to be known, loved, and supported. Finally, we see our last anticipation, living in hope of Christ's return. Verse 25, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Uh, The last thing that the author of Hebrews does is that he gives them a vision. He gives them a a very, very great vision. Remember, these Christians were being persecuted severely. Some of them, they stopped belonging to the church because they decided it wasn't worth their jobs, their lives, and their families. It wasn't worth it. I I, I just, it's hard. And and I don't, it's it's a hard decision for them. And And in fact, I understand in some ways their struggle that what they had on this earth was far more important to preserve. So they stopped neglecting to meet. They stopped meeting because the cost seemed too high and it was too risky. But here's what he does, the Hebrew, the author of Hebrews, he talks about how the day is drawing near. He urges them to lift their eyes beyond their immediate pain and situation to see the bigger picture, that faith in Christ is far more valuable than this world can ever offer. The day is drawing near. There's a far greater reward waiting for those who endure. And he's not diminishing their suffering or saying it doesn't matter. He's not pretending that the sacrifices they made are insignificant. No, not at all. But what he is saying, he's echoing what Paul says in Romans 8.18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. He's telling them, that what they are going through now, as painful as it is, cannot compare to the glory that will be revealed when Christ returns. Hence, endure, hold on, don't give up. Because faith in Christ is far more than anything that this world can offer. 
And the reward for those who endure is far greater than any temporary relief we might find by turning away. Now, our church today, as a, our, our struggle today as a church looks very different. Instead of persecution that the early church faced, instead of persecution, we're faced with seduction. That is our struggle. The early church hesitated because they didn't want to risk their lives for their faith. Whereas the church today hesitates because we don't want to give up our lives for the faith. We live in a culture that constantly tempts us to find our security, identity, and satisfaction in things other than Christ. It's not the threat of prison and death, handcuffs, that keeps us from committing fully to faith today. It's the golden handcuffs, right? It's the salary. It's the job. It's the allure of comfort, convenience, and self-preservation. We're drawn to the idea that, if we, that we can have both. Jesus and an untroubled life. Faith without sacrifice. Discipleship without discipline and rebuke. The cost of following Jesus may look different for every generation, but there's one common denominator. Following Jesus, there's a cost to it. Whether if it's of persecution or seduction, it might, persecution might not, be the th- it might not be the threat of persecution, but it is a subtle temptation to compromise. It's the pull toward apathy, the distraction of busyness, the desire to blend in rather than to stand out. If the early church had to ask, am I willing to die for my faith? We have to ask, am I willing to live fully for my faith? That is a very question that we are called to ask. Are we willing to give up our comfort our convenience, our complacency to follow Christ? Are we willing to prioritize gathering together, encouraging one another, being the church even when it's inconvenient or uncomfortable? Is our faith driven by convenience or marked by commitments? Because just as he writes, the day is drawing near. Belonging to the church helps us live in the light of this future hope. We remind each other that our present struggles are temporary and our true home is with Christ. Gathering together strengthens our resolve to stay focused on what truly matters. This is why I want to pray together as a church to really know together, not just theoretically, but in heart and prayer, what truly matters. I was part of a discipleship group once with a uh, group of men and with brothers. It was an intimate group of men and brothers, and it was, it was incredible. We were, we were there confessing our sins to one another, not just confessing sins, but we were going deeper than just confessing sins. We were trying to find the source of our sins and, f- and, 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 and to understand why we are tempted in certain ways, why, certain, why, why, why our hearts are being pulled in certain ways. And not only that, we weren't just spilling beans to each other. We were sharing the gospel to each other in ways that we have yet, that preaching does not do. Because now we were able to have dialogue with each other. We were part of a group that really began to desire to see repentance, that we called one another out in rebuke, but with love and grace. That year, I grew so much in Christ. I became a a better husband, a better father, a better Christian. Because I allowed people in my life, because I understood that the day is drawing near. This is what's important, that I multiply my faith as God calls me to do, and I can multiply others. This is what I want to do together as a church more than anything else. This is what's important to me. And I believe this is what God is calling us to do because the promise of Christ's return is just as real as it was for those early Christians. And the call to endurance is the same. We might not face persecution, but we face spiritual compromise. We might not fear for our lives, but we fear losing control, losing comfort, losing the things that we think make makes life worthy living. So what will it be, Emmanuel? Will we allow ourselves to be seduced by the comforts and distractions of this world? Or will we lift our eyes to the greater hope that we have in Christ because the day is drawing near? Will we settle for a faith that costs us nothing? Or will we pursue a faith that truly does transform us, a faith that endures, a faith that is willing to lose everything for the sake of gaining Christ? As we wrap up, Hebrews 10, 
this passage calls us to have a holistic faith that embraces the past by anchoring ourselves to the confession of Christ in the present by engaging today, by belonging to the church and fellowship and to the future. We live in anticipation of Christ's return, letting this hope shape our lives. You know, there's an old, old story about a, a, a traveler and he came upon three workers and they're, all, they're, they're just cutting stones. And he asks the first worker what he was doing. And he says, I'm just cutting stones. That's all I'm doing. He asks the second worker, what is it that you're doing? I'm making a living. I'm earning a living. That's all I'm doing. And he goes to the third worker. And the third worker, he's different. He smiles as he's cutting the rock. And he says, what are you doing? And he says, I'm building a church. All three were doing the same task. But only the third one had the bigger picture. Let's be like the third worker. In our daily lives, let's see beyond the mundane task and recognize that we're part of something greater. God's redemptive plan to build the church together. That we begin by building the church, by belonging to the church, as we anticipate, as we, as we anchor, and as we're assured of Christ's presence over us. Let's pray. God, we pray. Uh, let's, let's take a moment to pray in response to the word. Let's take a moment. If there's anything that this word is doing, that the spirit is doing in our hearts, let's take a moment to respond in prayer together as a church. Let's pray. Jesus, Lord, we thank you. God, we pray. Help us, Jesus, Lord. Help us, God. Help us to stir up one another, Jesus. Help us to see We would hold fast to your word. Thank you. God, we thank you, Jesus. We pray. Lord I, Lord, I pray it would be too idealistic to say that no one has been disappointed by the church. Lord, I'm sure there are those who have been hurt by members and Lord, even pastors. And Lord, while our hurts are real, Lord, we pray that we would anchor ourselves to Christ, to the confession of that he is Lord, and what he has done for us, that that, not our strength, that we would muster up some kind of forgiveness by forcing or believing that we can forgive, but Lord, resting in the person of Jesus Christ, being weak, Lord, in fact, because then you will be strong, that as I, as I decrease, as we decrease, you would increase, and Lord, that there would be wonderful grace that floods in, our church. And as Lord, we, we pray that we are a room full of broken people, but it's in the brokenness that your grace brings together a beautiful image of a church that loves God, that has been saved by the cross. And so Lord, we pray and confess that as for this house, Lord, may you lead it with grace as you always have. Lord, we pray that we would have a clear vision of who you are. And Lord, that that would guide and anchor us in the ways that we live. And so Lord, we pray that we would see that belonging to the church isn't just attending Sundays, but Lord, there's so much more to what the church is called to be. So Lord, we pray and thank you that Lord, we receive this word. And Lord, I pray, Lord, help me as a pastor 
to lead this church in prayer. Lord, help me that I would not lead by what I want, but Lord, how much you have already revealed by your will through the word. And so Lord, we pray that we as a church will come together in song, even in the midst of suffering, in praise, even in the midst of perseverance. And Lord, that we would sing hallelujah and see and behold the goodness of our God. So Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all rise and stand as we respond to the Lord in worship, as we sing, as for me and my house. Let our foundation be built on your majesty. Let every word you speak fill this home. Yes, Jesus, our course. Jesus, our cornerstone. Be anchor stone. for us. pray together as a church. You can lift a hand to hold their hand if you know them or just let's pray that we would be a church that truly is confessing God together, singing songs together in worship. Let's pray. Lord, we pray. Jesus, Lord, we pray. Help us, Jesus.
Lord, help us to hold fast to confession of our hope without wavering for Jesus, who is promised, is faithful. And Lord, help us that we would consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works, not neglecting to meet together, but encouraging one another all the more as we see you, as we see the day draw near. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you both now and forevermore. Amen.